Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to this ESGE webinar on how to perform a high quality endoscopy in inflammatory bowel disease. I'm Matt Rutter, and I'm a professor of gastroenterology at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom, and I'm also a previous ESGE uh, Quality Committee chair. Uh, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, we're expecting uh, over 300 participants from over 50 countries across the globe. So wherever you're dialing in from, and perhaps particularly those who are dialing in from a different time zone, you're very welcome. Today's topic is very close to my heart. Inflammatory bowel disease patients undergo many endoscopic procedures during their lifetime. And it's essential that the endoscopist performs a high quality procedure at the right time, and also protects the patient from low quality or unnecessary endoscopic procedures. Over the next hour, I'll be joined by two excellent speakers, Professor Marietta Iacucci and Dr. Karim Hamesh. Marietta is going to start with a presentation on endoscopy in the assessment of inflammatory bowel disease, and then Karim will cover IBD cancer surveillance. And then after the two talks, we'll have a Q&A session so please do use the Q&A function in, in Zoom to ask your questions. And without further ado, let's start. So I'd like to introduce my excellent colleague and good friend, Marietta, who's a professor of gastroenterology at the University College Cork in Ireland. And she's a real expert in this field. And I'm sure you're gonna enjoy her presentation. So Marietta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matt, for your kind uh, um, introduction. And uh, thanks to the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy to give me this opportunity to talk about uh, important diagnostics, so how to approach uh, the diagnosis of IBD. So these are my disclosure. So let's begin. So we know very well then endoscopy remission is an important threat to target in inflammatory bowel disease. And this is for stride two. Endoscopic remission is important for a favorable long-term outcome. But why endoscopy is important in inflammatory bowel disease? It's important for diagnosis, for assessment grade of the disease, for monitoring response to therapy and for surveillance, then my colleague will talk later, and also for therapeutic, then we will not touch today. So let's see what is important to understand also the endoscopy, how the evolution is evolving in more deep remission. We need to understand what are the target in inflammatory bowel disease. So the target is uh, no more a clinical remission, but we are going about endoscopic remission. And in 2024, we want histological remission. So we want to get endoscopy closer to histology for disease clearance, but more now we were talking about third dimension of uh, endohistoomics or endoscopy to assess barrier healing. And this is so deep, more deep. So this is the new era of the precision endoscopy in inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see here all the toys in the armamentarium that we have available for precision medicine inflammatory bowel disease. So we have the dichrome endoscopy, high definition, virtual chrome endoscopy, the ultra high magnification endocytoscope to see in real time histology and getting endoscopy closer to histology and the real life uh, histology with confocal laser endomicroscopy. And all these four, endoscopic assessment and histological remission, endoscopic for predicting the long-term outcome, for detecting and characterize lesion in IBD, and also to guide therapy. This is the concept. Look at how we changed from endoscopic healing, histological healing, transmural healing, complete healing. And we can see clearly what are the potential implications. So high rate of clinical remission, high rate of corticosteroids free remission, reduced number of flare-up, reduced change of medication, but most important, reduced colectomy hospitalization in these patients. So let's see what is the current landscape 
of endoscopy in IBD. So you can see we have uh, from assessment to detection. And what is available in most of the unit, uh, endoscopic unit worldwide, is high definition, dichrome endoscopy, and virtual chrome endoscopy. And the modern advanced imaging visualization of IBD is the, and of course, I always say this is elite, and uh, it's the confocalist endomicroscopy, endocytoscope, ultra magnification, the molecular endoscopy. But now we talk in IBD, and soon we will have the future, which is the which is the present, the artificial intelligence. Then can help to be, you know, then can be adopted by everyone for standardization of terminology and improve quality of care for our patients. So let's see what we have done with the, the, the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. So you can see we have developed the key performance indicator in IBD. And you can see clearly that it's a really important endoscopic assessment of disease activity, standardization, and adopting endoscopic score to speak the same language. And this then translates in the better treatment and management for patients. So look at it, it's important because if we use endoscopic uh, uh, scoring system, then they are validated or partial validated, we'll see together now. This is important and recommended for evaluating the prognosis and the efficacy of medical therapy. And also with the European Crohn Colitis Organization, we have stressed the concept of good quality report in IBD and good endoscopy. And so let's see when you do an endoscopy in IBD, so you need to, of course, using the best scopes is available. You need to segmentally assess the disease and grade the disease by using standardized endoscopic scores. But what are the endoscopic scores that you should use when you assess disease of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? This you can see here what is available, but what is, uh, let's say, more uh, convenient, more simple to use in real practice. Most of us use uh, for ulcerative colitis the Mayo endoscopic score. And you can see here clearly there is a four grade from zero to mild, moderate, and severe, which is related, of course, by presence of absence of erosion ulceration, intramucosal spontaneous bleeding, and decrease of vascular pattern. Mayo is partial validated, but simple to use and uh, you know, loved by all the clinicians in the daily practice. But then we have ulcerative colitis endoscopic index of severity, you say yes. Then consider the vascular pattern, the bleeding, and the erosion. Of course, erosion in ulcers then goes from zero to the pulsers. What happened? So let's see how to score. Oh, so let's see in real practice how to score ulcerative colitis. So this is very clear. So you see you are doing an endoscopy, a colonoscopy for IBD, for ulcerative colitis. So of course uh, you, you use the Mayo score. I think everybody agreed that this is a patient's has Mayo score of three. And then you see then there is ulceration, the interim mucosal bleeding, and then you say yes. So uh, you can score normally in my daily practice, uh, I do Mayo and then I do you say yes. If, if you switch in the virtual chrome endoscopy, which of course I do, you can consider it to score also with Picasso, when we, we know it's a little bit cumbersome, but compared, it's uh, uh, included in the mucosal and the vascular architecture. What about Crohn disease? In Crohn disease, we know we have simple endoscopic score, the, the CDIS, and now there is also the modified simple endoscopic score. But most of us probably use, I do regularly, we use the simple endoscopic score based on the size of ulcers, ulcerated surfaces, affected surfaces, the presence of narrowing. So let me give you an example. This is your patient's with Crohn's disease. So you, you first say you assess the ulcers, 
and the, you, the ulcers you, you consider grading on one or three based on the sites of the ulcers. Remember, the affected surfaces is not just related with ulcers, but you see here 5075 because you have a redema. And so you see it's circumferential. And then you have, uh, of course, the affected surface, then you need to consider only the ulcers. Let me give you another example, because I think it's more difficult to score Crohn disease. So you see you have ulcers, more than two centimeter, the ulcerated surfaces, and then the affected surfaces. And the simple endoscopic scoring system is seven, because you need to consider all these factors. So what happened when you have a post-operative recurrence of Crohn disease, you use the score, the Rutiger scores. And of course, you can see here, depend of the number of the aptose ulcers and depend if you have an involvement of neoterminal ileum or narrow. And then you can see you have from EI0 to I4. And you can see here the video. What is important in the new assess when you enter with the scope, you should assess first the uh, anastomosis, the, colon, the, the, the part, the site of the colon, and then the neoterminal ileum. After you have assessed with the endoscopy scores, which is a standardized, you know, terminology, key quality performance, is crucial the new, you know, for European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, biopsy, sample size sampling biopsies, it's important the new perform a right biopsies for diagnosis. And normally you should obtain at least two biopsies from the worst affected area for assessing the activity of the presence of the cytomegalovirus. This is in Crohn's disease and also maybe in, in a, you, know, you need to, to do at the age of the ulcers. This is the most important things to do. And uh, if you want to now the, the, with European Crohn colitis organization, we have developed a, a endoscopy platform where there is also Crohn disease, how to score. And there is uh, also ulcerative colitis. It's a very nice interactive videos uh, and with, uh, you know, mm, interactive uh, answer quiz, uh, whatever. And then you have also the um, optic IBD for detection and characterization of lesion. However, using this endos you know, white light uh, or there is some discrepancies and this is not what we really want in IBD. And these discrepancies, especially in ulcerative colitis, is related with the previous generation of the scope, lack of standardization of biopsies and lack of harmonization. So of scoring system. And we have shown then endoscopy can get closer to histology. So with uh, indeed, if you look at now we want endoscopic remission or deep remission with histological remission. In the endoscopy with the virtual electronic chrome endoscopy can really see, not really see, but get closer to histology. And you can see with uh, we have developed Picasso and if you look at it by switching just in real time, the endoscope. So and we have recommended with the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy tissue sampling guidelines to just switching in real time. Look at these patients. See, if you look at SIMS is normally in white light, but then if you win switch in a virtual chrome endoscopy with LCI or uh, with a, a, a BL light here or NBI, whatever you like, in the virtual chrome endoscopy, the patient is inflamed. So you can see here, this was the, our design of the study. We have considered 302 patients. We have looked at the mucosa of ulcerative colite patients with white light and then with the virtual chrome endoscopy. And the correlation with five different histological score was very strong. In the same time, so we could predict outcome at 12 months. If you are interested in the Picasso, you want to learn Picasso training, there is a training module and it's, this is the Picasso score. And there are a different kind of interactive video from the, you know, with the different kind of platform with the NBI, Bill Light, with the eye scan and with the different grade of inflammation from zero, you know, and from a moderate and severe with ulceration and activity of the disease. And so you can see in real time 
what is the intramucosal bleeding, what is the dilatation of the vessels. And I think also if, if it's not for Picasso, this can help you just to assess also patch inflammation and target biopsies. And this is crucial because of course, if the patient is still active, the patient needs to have escalation of treatment and optimize treatment for better outcome. What happened in now in now some centers, we have also ultra high magnification. This is the endocytoscope because we want to see real time histology. And then it's an NBI. So you can see you can have an NBI with alt high magnification. It's an alt high magnification of 520 fold magnification. You can put a, a dichrome endoscopy, they die with maiden and blue or cluster violet. You can see, you can see the vessels. We I, I work regularly, especially in high risk of patients or PSC. I use my endocytoscope. You can recognize the goblet cell, you can recognize the nuclei, and then which I show you and also the infiltration of the cell. And this will give you a real time if the patient has activity or not. What about confocal is endomicroscopy. Many centers now, they are equipped with confocal. It's uh, um, it give you a dynamic functional changes. And so you can see here, you have uh, epithelium, lamina propria, goblet cell, vessels, this is the terminal ileum, and if you look at the colon, you have this kind of daisy, and uh, which is the architecture, of course, the change base if you are superficial or, or deep. We know that confocal has been, you know, available for a long time, and it's for differentiating ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and also to predict flare-up long-term outcome. But what is important now then is becoming really, you know, interesting and exciting, the intestinal barrier healing. And there are many drugs now then probably that there are developing new drugs on acting directly on intestinal barrier healing. So endoscopy will be important to assess based on this, the response or not to treatment. And you can see from this recent study from Germany, then the intestinal barrier healing is superior to endoscopy in Logical remission for predicting major adverse outcome. So in now there is a lot of work around this and the importance to assess intestinal barrier, especially for predicting response to therapy to patients with the different ceiling of uh, uh, biological therapy and also to consider for future treatment target. But let me explain what, what is this. So. And uh, it's unbelievable how endoscopy is changing. It's going more in sophisticated way. So we know that the barriers play the abnormal impairment of the barrier play an important role in inflammatory bowel disease. And we know that this is just favoring the bacteria inside. So with the advanced technologies, uh, we can assess. So this is, a, you can see the ultra high magnification endocytoscope and the confocal. You can see the barrier, you can see the vessels and you can see if there is a impairment of the barrier. And you can see the impairment of the barrier is related with the leakage of the fluorescein. So this is what's on grade one is the, the grade that has been developed. So you can see here the, leakage of the fluorescein. The, here is the gaps, so the impairment, and of course some more gaps, uh, this the, the end in, in plumes of fluorescein with ulceration. And in the colon is due from this, uh, you can see this little spot, then it means uh, uh, or diamond increase leakage of the fluorescein. So this is what is happening now in the world of the IBD. So you see the intestinal barriers play an important role. With the advanced technology, we can see, so the alteration of the barrier, but also we are doing also some automated spatial multispectral imaging. Then uh, this probably will be translated in some, uh, you know, channel probe through the scope to see if there is a really alteration of the protein expression. But you can say, you say, but how can I do this in daily practice? So this is science, is cumbersome. We are overcoming this limitation by developing artificial intelligence or computerized imaging analysis that everybody can use. 
So you can see, so with the alteration, with a computerized barrier assessment, we, through enabled by artificial intelligence, we can assess definitely. And everyone can assess if the patient has, uh, is responding to treatment, is not responding to treatment, and also predict flare up in a short time on long term. But all these things is beautiful. So we have this modern advanced imaging visualization, but it's subjective inter-observer variability, and also ex and only expert only. So how can we make this available to everyone to improve quality and to improve you know, treatment for our patients? And with artificial intelligence, so we have now many models that have been developed and probably the first artificial intelligence that will be available in October will be the red density. Then I will show you in short time what does it mean? What, how does it work? So you can see this for what? For standardization, objective, rapid endoscopic assessment, and for accurate prediction of response to therapy and outcome. We developed the first, uh, you know, one of the first uh, uh, AI for with virtual chrome endoscopy using Picasso. And you can see how our model is working. And this can predict uh, as it predicted very well endoscopic remission and activity. But what we want in AI is the sensitivity specificity AI, but we want a prediction of long-term outcome in IBD, not just assessing disease activity is not sufficient. The other thing is so look at how you know works. So thinking about you have, uh, you know, healing, so the eye will not showing any, uh, I think I want to show you, if I can, the activity of the disease or mild inflammation. So you can see here, so look at you have here, so you can, uh, of course, activity, it's easy, but you, you can just, you know, assess uh, in, you say, yes, this is you, then you assess, but the eye, in the, the simultaneously will give you an opportunity to see if you have, there is a good probability then you have uh, uh, you know inflammation or not and i think this is what the future where are we going and this is the red density so the red density the future is here is a numerical scale from 0 to 255 because now we probably we abandon what is the endoscopic scoring system and we want an automated assessment of all the colon by number then everyone can use and and of course this can give us a you know assessment in real time of disease so this is the red density, is an operator in, independent, looks mainly in the vascular pattern, redness map, and this correlates very well with the endoscopy and histology. So let me give you an example of the red density. So look at, you are agreed, and this is the patients with inflammation. You say S is five. And look at, you have a twin mode. So you have a white light, and then the red density, and you see the score is more than, it's 90, so it goes to 92, 100 when there is erosion. And when it's an inquiescent disease, which I show you here, you can see the score is, uh, you know, you don't have this redness uh, and inflammation, and the score is 16 of 20. But now again, you see here, and, and I think uh, now we are working on the automated disease assessment score, also in clinical trial in IBD. So STIDA must develop this community disease score and uh, just to predict response to clinical trial with ustekinemab versus placebo. And you can see then the community disease score was able to see more granular endoscopic assessment. And of course, uh, this will beat it. So it was superior to the main endoscopic scoring system. So this is what we are going to automated scoring. And this also in IBD is a combined endoscopy with histology and with multiomics. So this, uh, I know maybe is a word of endoscopies, but this is what it is. So we want a prediction, a personalization, personalized medical treatment, prediction of response to therapy, prediction of flare up, and the endoscopy, the advanced imaging, fusing with histology, they are crucial with the epithelial barrier so the third dimension of healing, it's the future of endohistoomics enabled by AI in IBD. But 
AI is uh, beautiful, but still we need to work before. This can be used by everyone and for assessment for because we need standardization. We need clear study design. We need the simplicity. No, we can't be complex. We need to reproduce in real world by everyone. And we need to have an AI working group that can help to develop a standardize. We need performance measuring and audit. We, we need to establish what is the cost effectiveness. The most important, we need to make it acceptable among patients and physicians. And this help to implement tortuous way, but this can be done and the challenge as solution an AI can implement in clinical practice. So to conclude, what is the present and future diagnosis of IBD endoscopy? Definitely endoscopy is getting closer to histology. Definite standardization is important, speaking the same language for better care of patients. The new generation of the scope, they are getting closer to histology because the endpoint, the target of the IBD is histological remission or deep remission. And definitely this new and ultra high magnification in confocalis and microscopy automated with AI can help definitely in real practice to everyone to assess when do I need to de-escalate, de-escalate treatment. The gap barrier is the future of the horizon and it's some things we need to consider. And the endoomics, it's not just for science, but it is some things then it's part of the endoscopy. And thank you very much. I'm open to question. Marietta, thank you. That's an um, amazing presentation, wonderful slides as, as ever, and really illustrating a cutting edge uh, uh, endoscopy technologies. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so just to remind everybody, keep your questions flowing in. We'll reserve answering the questions until after we've heard our next uh, uh, next presentation, but do keep using the Q&A function and submit those questions, please. Um, but we'll move straight on to uh, our, our second presentation. So uh, Dr. Karim Hamesh is uh, assistant professor at the University Hospital of Aachen in Germany, where he's the head both of endoscopy and of inflammatory bowel disease. So ideally suited to, to, to talk on this uh, topic. Uh, he's, a, he's a rising star in endoscopy and, and IBD and a member of the uh, uh, Young German Gastroenterologist Society. So Karim's gonna talk about uh, cancer surveillance, neoplasia surveillance, in inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so Karim, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you for this kind introduction, Matt, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I really appreciate to present in this webinar. My task was to elaborate on surveillance colonoscopy in, in IBD. Uh, I have no relevant conflicts of interest. Well, surveillance in IBD is seen as a challenge. Techni on the one hand, it's challenging to do. So technically, it needs time and experience, for example, because there is a wider range of both neoplastic appearances as well as changes that in IBD are still considered to be normal. And the consequences are also challenging, both if we overlook neoplasia or if we misdiagnose and induce unnecessary surgery. On the other hand, it is challenging, or at least sometimes it might be challenging, to persuade others to do surveillance colonoscopy. So it might be challenging to motivate patients because they need multiple endoscopies and excellent preparation. And um, in terms of endoscopists, it is likely one of the most unpopular procedures. And it might be also challenging to convince people to do it properly, as there is no specific training requested. So let's start with a case as I'm curious what the audience thinks. So a 34 year old male patient was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis in May 22. After biologic therapy, he was in endoscopic remission. He is still in clinical remission, but now showed laboratory and MRCP findings highly suggestive of PSC. So how would you proceed in terms of surveillance colonoscopy? A, start with the surveillance colonoscopy right away. B, dye-based chromoendoscopy is required. C, virtual chromoendoscopy is equivalent to dye-based chromo. 
D, random biopsies are mandatory, or E, surveillance colonoscopy should be repeated every year. And the question here is, which of these answers is most likely wrong? So almost 20% said uh, right away. So it's, it's a mixed picture. And actually, um, if you see it, no answer is really wrong here. So this case should basically show that there are multiple approaches and sometimes contradictory recommendations. So um, there, there are many guidelines and my co-presenters are involved in several of them. And there is no dedicated ESGE guideline on IBD surveillance, but there are recommendations for quality, training, and how to visualize. There are also multiple other international recommendations as well as national guidelines. Here, I will focus on ESGE recommendations and will show recommendations from other guidelines where no ESGE recommendation exists. So this is my agenda for you. First, when should we start surveillance colonoscopy? Second, how often do we need to offer follow-ups? Third, uh, how should we do surveillance colonoscopy? And finally, how should we classify neoplastic lesions in IBD? So let's start with when to start. For UC, the recommendation is to start with surveillance eight years after symptom onset. And the same is true for Crohn colitis. If PSC is diagnosed, we should start with surveillance right away. And it is important to plan surveillance in phases of remission if that's possible, but we should also not postpone it because a patient is, uh, doesn't get into remission. However, if there is no relevant colon involvement, we should not start surveillance. So isolated ulcerative proctitis or in Crohn involving only one segment, we do not need to do surveillance. The next question is how many follow-ups do we need to consider? There are three groups. The first group is the high-risk group that necessitate annual colonoscopies. So patients with concomitant PSC, patients who had neoplasia or a stricture in the past five years, patients with extensive colitis and severe inflammation, or patients who have first degree relatives who were diagnosed with colorectal cancer being younger than 50. The second group are the patients with intermediate risk where surveillance is indicated after two to three years. So these are the patients with mild or moderate inflammation, those who have relatives with a colorectal carcinoma being older than 50 years old, and in some guidelines, also those who have many pseudopolyps. And finally, the low risk group consists of those patients who do not fit into the high or intermediate risk group, and those patients should receive surveillance every five years. So now we get to the more tricky part of how to do it properly. And let us first evaluate how the audience does it. So how do we usually perform surveillance endoscopy in IBD? Please choose from these four options. So I, A, high definition wide light endoscopy only, B, dye based chrome endoscopy, C, virtual chroma endoscopy, or D, do you refer the patients, but hopefully you will start doing surveillance colonoscopies from tomorrow on. So please choose and we will discuss uh, later on. Okay, so it's it's a mixed picture, so around uh, 30 or 25 to the 40 percent for for A to C, and only six percent are not doing uh, surveillance colonoscopies themselves. And yeah, actually there is evidence for the approaches A to C, which might make it a bit confusing. And um, to counteract any confusion. There are basically four pillars of surveillance in IBD. Whenever possible, use so it's one is high definition wide light endoscopy, then it's chromo endoscopy, targeted biopsies, and random biopsies. And whenever possible, use high definition uh, endoscopy, and the threshold should be low to biopsy lesions and abnormalities. Regarding chromo endoscopy, there is dye-based chromo and virtual chromo. And finally, there is the option of random biopsies with varying information how many biopsies to take. So to anticipate right away, 
It is often sufficient to use high definition white light endoscopy together with targeted biopsies. And the use of chromo and random biopsies depends on the situation and the guideline you would like to follow. And we will get into the details now. So an important prerequisite for any chromo endoscopy is good preparation. There are two possibilities for dye-based chromo as illustrated in these videos. One option is using the pump, which is the cheaper and more resource efficient alternative. It is important to perform rotational movements and to evaluate repositioning the patient to make use of the gravity. The other option is using a spray catheter, offering more steady distribution of the dye. It may also be faster. Again, do rotational movements, and here it is important to desufflate after spraying. And for both methods, you should suction excess solution after approximately one minute. There are two dyes that are equally recommended, so either indigo carmine or methyl in blue, and the concentrations are given here. So after the excellent talk of Marietta, everyone knows about virtual chromoendoscopy and uh, virtual chromoendoscopy has a similar detection rate as dye-based chromo, but it is faster and it offers better visualization in poor preparation compared to, uh, to dye-based chromo. And it is controversial whether there is added value on top of high definition endoscopy in standard risk patients. However, ESGE recommends to become familiar with dye-based chromo first before regularly performing virtual chromo instead of dye-based chromo. So before we uh, get to the recommendation, which chromo method is preferable, we are curious for your opinion. So how do you usually perform chromo endoscopy? So A, do you dye-based chromo with methylene blue? B, dye-based chromo with indigo carmine, C, virtual chromo endoscopy. And uh, for those who refer, you may also choose which option you would um, use if you would start doing surveillance colonoscopies yourself. Okay, so the majority of 58% uses virtual chromo and uh, a bit more people using indigo carmine uh, and 16% using methylene blue. So a bit of a mixed picture. So what shall we use now? Virtual or dye-based chromo? And basically all guidelines nowadays state that virtual chromo and dye-based chromo are equivalent if we use a high definition colonoscope. And this is maybe also the reason why the majority of the audience uh, uses virtual. So it is generally recommended to use a high definition scope because otherwise most guidelines request dye-based chromo endoscopy which is obviously more cumbersome. And the ESGE recommends to use dye-based chromo and virtual chromo routinely. The next controversial question is when to do random biopsies. So here I would also like to ask you first, when and how do you do it? Um, so basically A, never, you only do targeted biopsies. B, you only do it if a neoplasia was detected in a prior colonoscopy. C, always, because the more, the merrier. Uh, D, it depends, but if you do it, you prefer to take more biopsies, so four biopsies every 10 centimeters, or you do it most of the times, and then at least two biopsies per segment. Okay, so the majority, so like uh, three quarters, says it depends, or they do it most of the time, so either uh, quadrant biopsies or uh, almost a third of the audience and almost 40% do two biopsies per segment. And um, only 8% 8, 8 for example say they do it always. So it's a bit of a mixed picture again. So this was also a gut feeling that there is some heterogeneity. Yeah, and um, to anticipate right away, there is an ongoing debate, but the tendency is that random biopsies are not necessary in standard patients. So the, the ESGE does not request random biopsies routinely, but random biopsies are recommended in high risk situations, such as patients with a history of neoplasia, PSC uh, stricture or tubular appearing colon. And 
In these high-risk patients, the recommendation is to take more biopsies, so four quadrant biopsies every 10 centimeters, equaling 32 uh, biopsies in total. Likewise, the ECHO does not request uh, random biopsies, and SENIC did not offer a clear statement, but state that only one in a thousand random biopsies reveals neoplasia. Uh, maybe the important thing is, if you do not use a high-definition scope, most guidelines recommend performing random biopsies, which is another strong argument to always use a high-definition scope. <clears throat> So ESGE has several recommendations how to become competent in IBD surveillance. ESGE suggests a training for one week with an expert in IBD surveillance. It is recommended to do at least 20 chromoendoscopies and 20 targeted biopsies. And as long as someone is not competent, it is recommended to do random biopsies as a backup basically. Competency is suggested if the neoplasia detection rate is at least 10%. And to maintain competency, it is suggested to see at least 10 lesions in one year. So to summarize this chapter, here is a suggestion how to do it. Plan in a remission, in a phase of remission, but if remission is difficult to, to achieve, do not postpone it. By any means, try to use the best available scope. Um, Good preparation is very important and, and so wash actively to achieve ideally a Boston bowel preparation scale of nine. First, assess for inflammation. And if chromoendoscopy is indicated or if you would like to use it, um, focus on segments that are 20 to 30 centimeter long and then um, examine them sequentially. So with reinsertion of the endoscope through each segment before slow withdrawal. Do biopsies after inspection of a segment. So use targeted biopsies liberally and consider random biopsies, especially in high-risk patients. So finally, a few words on the classification of IBD-related lesions. There is the 5S rule, and we will go through these 5S together, which is site, surrounding, size, shape, and surface. Regarding site, you should ask yourself whether the lesion is in an inflamed or non-inflamed area. In non-inflamed areas, it might be a sporadic adenoma in contrast to pseudopolyp, as in the video here. Next, uh, have a look at the surrounding. How is the inflammatory activity? Are there any other lesions nearby? Are there any signs of submucosal fibrosis? Regarding size estimation, use a biopsy forceps as a reference. The fourth aspect is shape. So Senec consented on the Paris classification in conjunction with the descriptors ulceration and border. So the first aspect for the shape is the Paris, Paris classification. The main discriminator is whether a lesion is polyporid or not. Polyporid lesions are more frequently sporadic adenoma or pseudopolyps, and non-polyporid lesions are more frequently seen in IBD-associated neoplasia. Next, a lesion should be described whether there are signs of ulceration. Ulceration is suggestive for inflammatory polyps but also high-grade dysplasia. The third aspect is whether borders of a lesion are distinct or not. So indistinct borders are more frequent, for example, in cisiacerated lesions or inflammatory polyps. The final aspect is classification of a lesion surface. So everyone knows the Kudo classification and it's more reliable to use it with magnification. An alternative classification for IBD is the facile classification. It consists of four aspects, which are morphology. So again, here, the, uh, differentiating polyporid from non-polyporid, the surface architecture, um, the vessel architecture, and um, if, there is, yeah, if there are signs of inflammation within the lesion. And this dedicated classification helps to differentiate whether a lesion is a SSL an inflammatory a lesion, neoplasia, or actually cancer. 
So I would like to conclude with short answers to the four questions we discussed. Start eight years after onset or at the time of PSC diagnosis. You do not need to do it in isolated proctitis or in Crohn involving only one segment. We need annual follow-ups in patients with PSC, patients with neoplasia or stricture in the past five years in severe inflammation. And if there are first degree relatives who were diagnosed with colorectal cancers being younger than 50 at the time of diagnosis, every two to three years in mild or moderate inflammation, if there are many pseudopolyps or if there are first degree relatives with a cancer diagnosis being older than 50, and in all other groups, every five years is sufficient. Plan your surveillance colonoscopy in a phase of remission. Use the best available scope, so a high definition scope. If indicated, uh, you can do either virtual or dye-based chroma endoscopy. They are seen as equivalent. Do targeted biopsies liberally and take random biopsies in high-risk patients, for example, patients with POC or those with previous neoplasia. And for classification, use the 5S rule, so site, surrounding, size, shape, and surface, and uh, use virtual chromoendoscopy to properly classify. There is a great tool from ECHO, so for those who are interested to dig deeper, please find uh, the link uh, below. Yeah, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Karim, thank you. That was a, a wonderful presentation. We're really spoiling the audience this evening, aren't we? It's it, it's a, a two fantastic presentations. Some really good questions coming through. Uh, keep those questions coming through. We've got about 10 minutes or so to try and pick off it, as many of those as we can. Uh, Marietta, if we, if we can invite you back onto the stage, please. So um, Karim, I will come straight back to you. So. Uh, we've had a question from Rune saying, um, what about post-inflammatory polyps or pseudopolyps as they're often called? Uh, are these still considered a risk factor for dysplasia? Yeah, so this is what I, I, I mentioned earlier. So this is a bit controversial and some guidelines say if there are many pseudopolyps, this is considered to be a risk factor. And this is the reason why these patients should be classified in that intermediate risk group. So these, for those who have many this, many pseudopolyps, you should do colonoscopy every two to three years, but it's quite uh, controversial and it's also quite difficult. It, so actually assessing or, or, or basically estimating the risk of neoplasia in, in, in patients with ongoing inflammation is very challenging. And it might also be misleading to think that it's a, uh, pseudopolyp because I, I have shown you on one slide that ulceration is also a factor that is um, frequently seen in, in, in the high grade dysplasia or even in cancer. So being sure that it's a it's a pseudopolyp is quite challenging. And if you have if you are sure that there are many pseudopolyps, it's considered by many to be a risk factor. So this is why you should do your surveillance colonoscopies more frequently. Uh, thanks. And yeah, it's this is a question that I'm always asked uh, when, when I give presentations, because I think we know in reality it, it is so challenging. Um, I mean, many people will only have a few post-inflammatory polyps and that's fine. But sometimes you'll get a whole you know forest of them and it can make it so, so difficult uh, to to spot the dysplastic lesion am amongst the post-inflammatory polyps and uh, man meat. Hello, Manmeet. Uh, uh, um, it's nice to see you joining this evening. Uh, you've asked a question about whether all endoscopists should perform IBD surveillance colonoscopy. And I think yeah, I, I'll, I can answer that. Um, and Manmeet, I guess, knows the answer I'm going to give, which is, is I don't think they should. And I think it's for exactly these reasons. It can be really challenging. It's not like a standard colonoscopy where the background mucosa is, is normal. Quite often, you've got a wide variation of background mucosa, chronic features, active inflammatory features. And that, that's just the normal end from, an, uh, uh, from a dysplastic perspective. But then you've got this wide spectrum of uh, dysplasia as well. Not everything looks like a sporadic adenoma. So I think it's so, so challenging for endoscopists to build up that um, 
skill set, that expertise in understanding what you're looking at. So uh, my answer to Mammy's question is no, I think we should be targeting these patients towards endoscopists who really have built up a lot of experience in these in these techniques. Um, Karim, now that I've sort of overloaded that question, do you agree with that or do you think otherwise? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And this is also the reason why I put that option in the poll, because I think it's absolutely fine to say, I prefer to refer this patient either because you do not do a lot of IBD or because it doesn't, isn't, it's not reimbursed. So for example, in Germany, it, you do not have the time and there is no extra reimbursement to do it. And I think that's also a reason which is fine to say, let someone else do it. And um, the, the, other, the other way around, it's a problem that there is no prerequisite who is allowed to do it. So basically, if people think they're, uh, so that they have enough experience, but they just do it very quickly, the patient and the physician might feel safe, but actually some dysplasia have been overlooked. And if the next surveillance gonoscopy is in three or four years and we will detect cancer, or in the meantime, that's, uh, uh, that would be a pity. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, to, to, to say the least, yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, Marietta, um, there's a question that came in during your presentation about Rutgert scores uh, and I2A and I2B. So I wondered if you wouldn't mind just explaining what the difference is uh, and whether you think that that difference has any any cl clinical relevance, please. Yeah, it did. Uh, it is a good question because um, I had already these beautiful slides, so I didn't update the I2A, I2B. Uh, and definitely in the course of ECHO then we have developed, there is clearly definition about I to A, I to B. So uh, this is a, a challenge a question in terms of then we are now running a new study, which is the PROSPER study, then we will answer this question. Uh, we know very well that patients 2A can be ischemic and uh, or can be nothing. Um, and there are some evidence based uh, mainly on retrospective st study, then to be, uh, then our more uh, lesion um, should be, you know, considered escalated to treatment uh, because uh, these patients, they have more risk to develop uh, inflammation, develop, you know, flare up in long term. Uh, I think we should use the modify Paris classification, and I agree. I think, sorry, the Rutgers classification. And I think we should pay attention to the 2B because they have high risk patients, they have risk for recurrence, but I think it's not really clear yet. I think, I hope with this PROSPER, which is a prospective study, international, multi-center, where we will consider all the early recurrence of patients and we can answer clearly to this question in understanding when do we need optimized treatment or not. Because if we have an ischemic lesion, giving a biological therapy will be, you know, just the cost and also, um, you know, side effects for our patients. So I think we should consider the modified rotator, so we will recommend. Uh, we need to consider the, the, the Rutgers to be its high risk of recurrence. But however, my answer is then uh, we need to have more study, prospective study to be more, uh, you know, precise uh, on this definition and the long-term outcome. Thank you. And then there's another question, question from uh, Jane Mishevsky, if I pronounced your name correctly, um, okay. about using non-invasive markers to assess disease inflammation and i guess this circles back to what i was saying right at the outset about protecting people from unnecessary procedures so marietta what's your view on when we should be using a, a, a colonoscope and when we should be avoiding doing a, col a colonoscopy please I think uh, I agree. Um, biomarkers, uh, probably at the moment, we have a very good fecal cup protecting, which help. Hopefully, in the future, we can develop uh, more, uh, uh, you know, biomarkers. There are a lot uh, of predicting study that are ongoing with omics and uh, um, 
I think uh, we should do colonoscopy in patients for diagnosis. Um, when we want, of course, in the severity of the disease, we want to rule out uh, no, uh, CMV uh, for surveillance. Uh, I think we should just do in a colonoscopy after six months of biological therapy, because I think we you want to see if the patient has really respond to therapy. Post-operative recurrence is standard of care, you know, after six months, I think you should see. But I think I agree. Other than that, I think you can monitor your patients with fecal cup protecting. And now also with ultrasonography, with the um, intestinal uh, small bowel, uh, I think uh, um, it's a good uh, um, toy uh, to just monitoring our patients. So I completely agree. Patients doesn't need uh, all the colonoscopy, unnecessary colonoscopy. Thank you. Thanks. So Karen, um, there's a question about how long we should allocate for a, a surveillance colonoscopy because um, they are more challenging, as we've alluded to. So, so how long do you allocate on your lists? So there's the general recommendation to double the, the slot time and we allocate one hour for, for surveillance colonoscopies. Wow. But sometimes one hour is not enough. And unfortunately, go. sometimes the patient preparation is just not sufficient. And then it doesn't really make sense to do it. And then you don't need the full slot. I yeah. think yeah. one hour is a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, certainly in the UK and maybe Ireland too. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we'd be allowed to, to do that. But, but I think the point is well made that you, know, you you do need to have sufficient time to to, live, to do these procedures well. And bowel preparation is important. My tip for everybody is, you know, these patient, patients have had procedures before, so read the previous report, see whether the prep was poor previously, and if it was, don't just give the same preparation. You have to give enhanced preparation uh, so you can learn from how it was previously. A great point. Which brings me on to another point, I guess, which is about, Report writing. So, Marietta, you mentioned this, and you know we're very keen on this. Um, and Kareem, you'll have experienced this in in your IBD practice. There's nothing more frustrating than when a report comes through that tells you someone has ulcerative colitis, which you knew anyway, and doesn't particularly describe the severity of the inflammation, or doesn't discri discriminate between chronic inactive features such as post-inflammatory polyps or scarring and active inflammatory features. So um, I'll, I'll allow you to, to add into to my sort of um, my thoughts on this, but, but, but essentially I think these reports also take time to write. And I think you have to be quite uh, verbose when you're writing these reports. You need to uh, spend time really detailing the acute features, uh, where is affected, what are the separate chronic features, uh, lots of photos. I mean, both of you have illustrated how important photos and videos can be and how illustrative they can be. So um, uh, I think it really does. It's not just about doing the procedure. It's about describing what you saw. Otherwise, the clinicians can be misled and uh, use the wrong treatment or you have to bring the patient back for another procedure. Um, Marietta, would you... Do you, do you agree with that, sir? Absolutely. We did, uh, uh, I think, uh, the key quality performance was not just to create, uh, you know, key, we, we stressed the concept also of standardization of endoscopic scoring system. And also with HECO, there is a, a, a you know, we, we just did a statement opinion about just guiding step by step what, uh, what, how is important to standardize. So harmonize standardization, I think is crucial. It's important if I have a report and I say, you know, you will tell me this May or three, no? And of course you can describe, uh, but uh, I think uh, all using the scoring system, you can immediately through the scoring system with the standardization, you can understand, uh, you know, what is the activity of the patients. And the same with the lesion. We have created the 5S, you know, because we wanted the people, they can remember 5S. So sites, it's crucial because the sites, it's important for guiding the resection, ESD, EMR, or surgery. 
if it's surrounding of uh, E. coli is uh, or not, because uh, your approach on the sporadic adenoma is different compared with the low-grade or high-grade dysplasia associated with colitis. Paris, uh, it's crucial. So I think uh, we should stress, and I think all the societies, also the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy and all of all, you know, just uh, they are putting a lot of effort uh, to just standardize language because language is a quality of care. Thank so, you. Okay. So I think we've probably only got time for one more question because uh, we are past the hour. Uh, so which one should I pick up on? Uh, so Karim, um, question about serrated lesions, because historically we've only focused on uh, uh, dysplastic lesions, but of course not all serrated lesions are dysplastic. So a non-dysplastic serrated lesion, um, what's the relevance of that, do you think? H how should we, we be managing those lesions in inflammatory bowel disease? So I think the first challenge is to be sure that, that, that it is a non-dysplastic serrated lesion. So I think it's not as straightforward as in non-IBD patients. And if the lesion is small and if the endoscopist feels competent to resect it, my personal approach would be to just, just remove it and be on the safe side. And then you have the full histology. And the other thing is, and there was not enough time to touch on that, I, I, I highlighted the several challenges in IBD. Endoscopic resection in IBD is also a challenge. And this is also something where you might consider to refer them to someone else. So usually for these smaller lesions, uh, it's not that difficult, but the, the larger the lesion gets with all that submucosal fibrosis and so on, it is. I think it's not a shame to refer these patients to someone else. Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent message to to finish the the, the, the webinar on. Uh, you know, never uh, um, be afraid to refer to somebody else. I think that's always good practice, and I totally agree. Therapy in inflammatory bowel disease is 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 particularly challenging, and you need to get it right first time. So, a really good message to to end on. Uh, so, um, we've got some final slides, but just before we move on to those, just just to thank. Uh, both of our speakers, I think the audience will really appreciate. We've had two extremely high quality presentations, some wonderful pictures. I've uh, really enjoyed the discussion. As ever, we run out of time. We haven't managed to answer everybody's questions, so apologies for that. Um, but I think uh, all of us will be at, well, certainly I, I'm going to be at uh, ESG days, and I know Mari Marietta will too. So come and find us and uh, ask us the same questions, and we'll try and answer those in person. Uh, but on that note, we'll go on to our uh, final slide. So just to remind you, it's uh, ESG uh, Jubilee cel Celebrations. Uh, so we've been around for 60 years now. So uh, 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 we'll be in Berlin, of course, next month. So um, I do hope that you'll be joining us there. Uh, these are excellent conferences that have been running for a few years now. And I think that really are superb educational events. So do come and join us for, for that. And uh, don't forget that this is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. So uh, you can log into the ESG website and uh, uh, there's various interactive uh, infographics that you can use to uh, promote uh, colorectal cancer awareness. So uh, some tips here. Um, and, and again, as I say, all of this information can be found on the, on the website. So please, please do access the ESG's website. And to remind you again, it's our Diamond Jubilee year. I don't know what we do for Diamond Jubilee year, but uh, I'm very happy to join you for a drink in, in Berlin next month. Uh, we have fellowship grants for uh, uh, the, the younger of, of you. Uh, so please do again, tap into the website and if you're interested in finding out more, all of the information is available on that website for you. And please do join. I suspect mo most of you are already members of ESG, but if you're not, it's a fantastic community, a very friendly, a vibrant community. Uh, so it would be wonderful if your picture was on this slide the next time that we meet.
which will be uh, later this month. So in, in two weeks time, we have our next webinar. So I hope you're able to join us for that. So we're gonna change tack and look at uh, um, training in diagnostic endoscopic ultrasound. So please do, do join us and Terry, uh, Tony Tam will be uh, chairing uh, that webinar. So thank you once again, wonderful meeting uh, uh, and uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Uh, I don't know how long your day is, wherever you are in the world, uh, but enjoy it and take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.